The Lord said in John chapter 13, verse 35, Everyone will know by this that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Now, growing as a congregation of believers is never easy. There's always challenges. The goal of being Christ-like is obvious, but the path can be difficult. I mean, for a start, we live in a society which is profoundly apathetic, if not just atheist, and we need to sort of resist that pervading pressure. But also, building a temple actually takes work. It takes all of us to be committed to being open, to being Christ-like, to being loving towards each other. And one of the challenges is that we're social animals. You know, we, we want to belong to a community. Now, the word community isn't a panacea to all ills. Because if you have a community, by definition, you have an in-group, but you also are defining outside. Whereas John says that God so loved the world that he, bega- he gave his only begotten son. There's no edges in that. It reaches to everybody. We're not immune from creating an in and an out, an acceptable and unacceptable, a, a template of what a good Christadelphian should look like, you know, preferably blue tie, suit, all of that sort of thing. Don't look past the suit. It's, it's, this is the best I've got. Um, Jesus didn't call us, though, to be you know, part of a... Uh, I guess, a club, right? Because congreg- uh, communities or, or clubs, they can become about, become about sameness and stability and, and preservation and routine. Jesus called us to a movement. Jesus, Jesus called us to, to change ideas, values, being forward-looking, being adaptable to the circumstances that come to us. You know, one of those things is safe. It's predictable. It's It's comfortable. Right? especially for people like me that aren't that keen on change. But movements can be a little chaotic. They can be a little bit, well, feel unstable because they're able to adapt to new circumstances and challenges. The values of this man don't change, but perhaps how we apply them might. I mean, there's been radical changes uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years in this congregation, as there has been throughout the, the world of Christadelphia. And that needs to continue to progress. This morning we want to talk a little bit about the Antioch congregation, right? And how they acted and how they really were a movement, right? And what hopefully we just want to pick out is they were early adopters. You know, they were prepared to step out and do what was right, even when there was internal pressure not to do that. Even when people resisted implementing the the values of Jesus. Antioch was a place of renewal and healing. It was a place of outreach, not just preaching, but also rejuvenating people and bringing them into the fold. They were incredibly charitable, even to people with whom perhaps they had an interesting relationship. Um, We'll see that they're also culturally and racially very diverse. Um, And It's a testament of history that their approach of being very straightforward and rational with God's word endured for centuries. Now, this morning might be a little uncomfortable. In one way, I kind of hope it is just a little bit because, you know, it's important for us to reflect and to think uh, about how we're progressing and how we're implementing the values of our Lord. As I said, I'm naturally um, conservative and slow to change. But the congregation in Antioch wasn't like that at all. And I think if we think about this group, how they outworked the values of Jesus and, and one of its key movers, Barnabas. Hopefully we can take some encouragement about that and the need and the opportunity to be radically loving. Acts presents us with this incredible picture of the early community, the early um, believers. They were sharing fellowship, they were meeting in the apostles' doctrine and practice, they were preaching, they were incredibly generous with welfare, and they were continually having fellowship, going to the temple. Uh, the population at large held them in high esteem. Right? It's, it's all good stuff in the early chapters of Acts. Right? And even when they were persecuted, they didn't fold to that pressure, they, they went out further preaching, taking the message of Jesus with them. Right? And you think about who's there in that congregation. You've got the apostles, right? Spirit-led 
men who had, had been with Jesus before and after his resurrection. There's probably a, a large number had actually of the congregation at large had known Jesus and heard him teach, right? It's presented in, you know, certainly the first six, seven chapters as this ideal congregation, right? And everything was just peachy, perfect. But was it really? Well, the rest of Acts starts to show us that there were opportunities for growth in this group. They were a work in progress, just like we continue to be. Now, I want to think about one of the major divisions and issues that that congregation and Acts itself sort of unwinds. You know, Luke's history uh, in, in Acts is written to the Gentiles, so it gives us just a simplistic guide, so we're going to be simplistic this morning. We're going to recognise that the truth is a lot more complicated, that um, as, as various people have observed, that Palestinian Judaism was, you know, not a hermit kingdom, it, there were a lot of different attitudes, but simplistically just, you know, to, to work through this and not take forever. The Jews essentially saw three main classes of people. There were the Jews proper who lived in Judea, from whence the name was derived. There were the alternative, you know, the diaspora, the Jews who lived outside the land, uh, and they're typically referred to as Hellenists. They are a little bit more integrated into the Greco-Roman culture of the day. And then, of course, you've got the Gentiles. Uh, and... The Jews had a fairly dim view of the Gentiles, and we need to understand that when we come into Acts, how ingrained that, that, that issue with the Gentiles is. It's not that the Jews were more xenophobic than anybody else. Uh, certainly in Australia, we have no basis to stand on any, uh, any platform of purity there. But the issue that the Jews had with the Gentiles was underpinned by the law, by the morality of the law, by the fact that under the law, your neighbour was richly unclean. Right? Paul actually sort of references this in uh, Galatians 2 verse 15 where he sort of gives the, uh, there's this offhand comment almost, well, we who are Jews know this, we're not sinners of the Gentiles. And that sort of expression pretty much reflects the attitude uh, that people had to, the, the Jews had. They were very much a closed community, right? So this is another issue. Um, whilst Matthew uh, 23 verse 15 does actually refer to a little bit of preaching that the Jews did, on the whole, there was no external mission, right? The Jews collectively were not out to convert people to Judaism, and very few people did. It wasn't particularly easy, and it could be quite painful. And as the scholar McKnight puts it, for the Jews of this time, they were a light among the nations, not a light to the nations, right? Their view was that in the great day of God, all the Gentiles would be converted to worship him, so don't bother putting the time and effort in now. And again, speaking simplistically, there were exceptions to this. Right? But there wasn't any real uh, concerted uh, external mission to convert people to be Jews. So when Jesus in Acts 1 verse 8 says to his disciples, you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the absolute ends of the earth, what every sane, right-thinking person heard is you're going to talk to the Jews, well, that's obvious, uh, here, broadly, in Samaria, a bit risky, and to the ends of the earth, well, that doesn't mean you're going to talk to the Gentiles, obviously, you're only going to talk to the children of Abraham scattered through the world. We hear that quite differently to what they did. Right? And so, uh, if we look, this is not a, an attitude that changed quickly. Right? If you flick across to Acts chapter 21, right, the law which underpinned this perspective of a difference between Jew and Gentile, a fundamental difference, it continued to play a role in the lives of believers. This is not something they gave up easily. Right? When we read the recollection of um, Peter's report on his interaction with Cornelius this morning, but the attitudes continue to persist that the law was fundamental. So Acts 21, this is a long way down the track. Right? This is just before Paul's you know, going to get arrested and start the final journey to Rome. So we're a long way into history. Um, Acts chapter 21, verse 20. Paul goes to meet James and the elders, and they tell him this. Many thousands of the Jews there are who have believed, and they are all ardent observers of the law. Right? This is a long way down the track. They're still ardent adherents to the law. And their suggestion, so this is coming from James and the elders of the Jerusalem Ecclesia, they say to Paul, well, there's some 
some fellows here who have completed a ritual vow. Uh, verse 24, uh, you should go up with them and participate in the rituals so everyone will know there's nothing in what they've been told about you but that you yourself live in conformity with the law. Right? Yeah, okay, we kind of get now, you know, 10 chapters on past Cornelius, that the Gentiles are part of this, but in the Jerusalem Ecclesia's view, and as Paul would discuss in Romans 14, observing the law was fundamental to who they were and what they thought. So much so that they saw it as a salvation issue. It was a fundamental fact of faith in Jesus that you still continue to observe these elements of the law. And you think, well, how much does it take to shift? All right. How much does it take to change us? Let's not, you know, drill in on these people, but we will take examples from them. It takes an enormous amount, right? We know the story with Acts chapter 10, we, uh, the visit with Cornelius from Peter, because he reprises the story in Acts 11, which Matt read for us. Would you tell an angel three times, no? I mean, you know, who's courageous here, right? You might hesitate a fraction, but to tell an angel, no. Nah. No way known, not going to, never have, never will. End of discussion. Three times repeated. Right? That's how fundamental to, to uh, Peter's discipleship this idea of keeping elements of the law is. You have to be very certain to tell an angel, on your way, I'm not doing this. Okay? This is not a light issue. Right? This is not something that Peter or anyone else in Jerusalem thought was a, uh, an optional extra. We keep the law because, you know, it's kind of useful and it's nice and it's just tradition. No, this is fundamental, tell an angel, go away, not doing it. Right? It doesn't get much more fundamental than that. And, you know, it's pretty obvious that eventually God basically forces Peter's hand by giving the Holy Spirit out to Cornelius' household. Right? Because he still was not going to get with God's agenda. Well, all of that, and we read this morning, and if we flick back to Acts 11, perhaps, um, the fact that you've got, you know, the 12 there, that you've, you've got the witness of Cornelius and, and all of this, uh, Cornelius' conversion and all of that, how much does it change? Right? The evidence is pretty clear, Right? that the radical gospel message is going out to the Gentiles, and they get that, verse 18. When they heard this, they ceased their objections. They praised God, saying, so then God has granted repentance that leads to life, even to the Gentiles. Wow. And then see what they do next. That's right. Pin drop. Absolutely nothing. That's what verse 19 tells us. Those have been scattered because of persecution that took place over Stephen, went as far as Phoenicia, Cyrus and Antioch, speaking the message to the Gentiles that God had now included. No, 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 not going to do that. They continued to speak only to the Jews. So even when they've intellectually grasped that things need to change, they are still not going to get with God's program. Change is hard, even when writing is on the wall. Uh, now, all I'm trying to do, it sounds like we're being very down on the Jerusalem Ecclesia, we're not. Okay. All I'm trying to point out is that as human beings, we have a tremendous difficulty separating between God's principles and our preference. It's really easy on paper, but when push comes to shove, the things that have been ingrained in us for decades, sometimes more, sometimes less, are really hard to shift, even if we intellectually accept that perhaps we need to push that to one side. We need to be open to considering that perhaps, well, perhaps our understanding and application of God's truth isn't yet done. You know, as a denomination, we, and I, I do the same thing, I don't like it, but I still do it, uh, we occasionally refer to our, our group uh, and our doctrines or whatever else as the truth. And a lot of people say, oh, we don't like that. But, but that's something which, you know, it, it's, it, it's a hard habit to shift. But it reflects a mentality that, you know, it's done, we're finished. And that's how the Jerusalem Ecclesia would have felt too. But were they done? No. No. Even though the gospel didn't change, 
their appreciation for how things needed to be implemented, how the values of Christ needed to be applied, that continued to evolve. Fairly brave of us to consider that that's not also going to be true of us. That as the environment, as the issues we face collectively um, change, that maybe our understanding and application needs to change and some cherished preferences might need to be consigned to history. Antioch is a fantastic example of a group that were prepared um, to implement the values radically. Everyone knew the Gentiles were in, but no one was going to do it until you get to Antioch. And it's in Antioch in verse 20 that a few of the, the Jews from the diaspora, the Hellenists, actually finally extend the gospel deliberately to the Gentiles. Now, in hindsight, we know that that was God's plan, but not everyone's convinced about that, right? And uh, in verse 22, we read that Barnabas is sent to Antioch. Now, I'm not sure about this, okay? So, you can come up uh, afterwards and, you know, chase me around the hall or something. What was the spirit that Barnabas was sent with? It seems a bit curious to me that when Philip in chapter 8 is going out and he preaches in Samaria and there's this great response, everyone in Jerusalem is really excited. This is fantastic. And they send Peter and John to, to pass on the Holy Spirit gifts. Okay? But now when the, when the gospel's been preached to the Gentiles, they don't send Peter and John. They send Barnabas. Now, Barnabas is a great bloke. All right? he's, a, he's a wonderful example. But there's clearly a difference in the way they respond. Okay? And the attitude of the Jerusalem Ecclesia doesn't sort of stop in just there. Um, in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, there's, you know, very clearly negative interference. Certain individuals came down from Judea, were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved, right? We're going to cling to this law and it's got to be, it's essential, it's fundamental. And it doesn't stop, it keeps going. In Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 13 to 15... Paul talks about the incident where people again came from Jerusalem, start putting pressure on and, and everyone, including Peter who's there, because there is now an apostle there, things appear to have moved along. But it ends up that Peter stops associating with the, uh, with the Gentiles. Now, I think that's just probably different. This is not about now circumcision, but you know, they've, they've probably moved to a soft separation, you know, Jews to the left, Gentiles to the right, and let's just, for uh, simplicity, keep the two apart. But there's still this underlying motivation that we are not going to let go of the law and we're not going to let go of this preference because they never called it preference. It's fundamental to salvation and, and harmony in the, in the ecclesias at large to keep this in place. But they're incorrect. I suspect that when Barnabas is sent up, it's a little bit to come back and give a report, right? To give a bit of a this is what's going on, report back to those in Jerusalem. Now, of course, Barnabas is a, a lot, lot bigger than that and he ends up joining the Antioch Ecclesia, uh, which is, you know, full credit to him. Okay, so what are we saying? Well, we're incredibly gifted in reading God's meanings and intentions quite narrowly. We're all very good at taking God's principles and somehow inserting our preferences and attaching them all together in one big package. And it's hard to get a big view of God. It's hard to take preferences, history, tradition, what we consider to be orthodoxy and, and put that to one side and just deal with, well, how do we apply the values of Christ? Because just like the Jerusalem Ecclesia, right, the apostles, people who'd heard Jesus teach, um, you know, incredible report card in Acts 1 to 6 as like an ideal ecclesia, brilliant. But the reality is they had a little bit of a doctrinal issue in truth, as they saw it, that needed to be worked through and developed. If it could be true of them, it can be true of us. We can unknowingly have a, a, a view of God that's too small. Now, let's just be very clear because from time to time, People can get, uh, perhaps take things, I say, a little bit too far and, and freak out. I'm not advocating a free-for-all. 
I'm not advocating everyone does what's right in their own eyes. You know, the judge's experiment has tried, it failed. Leave it in the history book. Um, or every man and his dog develops their own creed of faith. No, I'm not saying that. All right? We have foundational, um, a foundational basis of fellowship. It's a useful thing. But more important than any of our fellowship underpinnings, right, those doctrinal underpinnings, is how we then apply the values of Christ to bring those doctrines to life in their fullness, right, as he wants them to be, without being constrained by what, with a bit of work, might actually turn out to be our prejudice or our preference or our history, rather than what Christ would have us do in his ecclesia. So Antioch was prepared to implement the gospel, regardless of cultural challenge and history. But it was more than that, right? And we'll move a fraction on. Antioch was a place of healing, okay? And I want to particularly pick up the example of Paul and Barnabas um, in Antioch, because I think this is a very practical piece that we can, we can grab and, and use. When Paul initially went to visit Jerusalem uh, in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, it's recorded, he tried to associate with the disciples, but they're all afraid of him, right? Because they thought he was now just going undercover as the persecutor. And it was Barnabas who took Saul, as he was then known, and brought him to the apostles and integrated him into the congregation. And, you know, that lasted for a while until trouble started and they, they shipped him out to Caesarea and then he got shipped off to Tarshish. And there appears to have been an underlying um, fear that continued for a long time, right? Um, just a matter of interest, Romans 15, 25, when Paul was going to bring uh, donations to the poor in Judea, he actually asked the Romans to pray for him um, so that his ministry in Jerusalem would be acceptable. I mean, it's usually acceptable when you bring people financial aid. So what's he mean by that? Well, I suspect he means that people who had lost mum and dad to his persecution might still have a bit of a problem with this individual, right? So there's, you know, there's difficulty integrating Paul into the community. Barnabas was a bridge builder. Now, that's something, reality, we can all do. You know, Paul was a bit of a loose end. He'd been integrated into the community by Barnabas. He then ends up getting shipped off to Tarsus. And you never really hear of anything in Tarsus. It, it's not like there's an ecclesia there that he goes and ministers to ever again. It, it, it's, nothing, it's almost like he's fallen off the map. Um, but Barnabas, once he's come to Antioch, he goes and gets the scary convert, Saul, Paul. And again, he brings him back in, in verse, Acts 11, verse 25. He brings him back... Uh, onto the field of play. Now, that's incredibly brave, given how afraid people rightly were of the man. And this is also persistent pastoral care. You know, one of the amazing features of you know, Halifax is our ability to, uh, to embrace and heal those who've perhaps lost their way, for whatever reason that is. Okay? Uh, we're not perfect. I'm not claiming that we're perfect by any stretch. But plenty of people come to Halifax looking for shelter, looking for a restart, looking... You know, for faith, looking to, to get back uh, into the community again. Well, there's an opportunity for everybody to be a Barnabas, right? To give people a reason to come, to involve them, to uh, open up the rosters, bring them back to lunch, uh, put them on committees, music, whatever that is. And, and Paul wasn't, you know, an obvious candidate. You know, in 2nd of uh, Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 10, um, you know, his opponents said of him that his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. You know, Paul was no striking sort of, you know, six foot tall, blue hair, blonde eyed charisma machine. But it, that was deliberate, in case you picked that up. Um, but he ended up turning the world upside down with his preaching. Right? That wouldn't have been immediately obvious. Not if he genuinely was, you know, a fairly ordinary looking specimen who stumbled over his words. Um, but when you reach out to somebody, when you be a Barnabas... Who's to say that God isn't then going to light the fire in that individual and turn the world upside down? We don't know. Barnabas just reached out. And simple reality. Sometimes you reach out to people, it picks up for a little while and then they sort of fall in a bit of a heap again. You know, like Saul, off to Tarsus, deathly quiet. Barnabas could have said, been there, done that, tried that horse before, I'm not going again. No. Barnabas was persistent in his pastoral care. And ultimately, look where it led. It's not a one-try kind of thing. Now, I don't know. I don't know how you can be a Barnabas. 
what extent you can reach out to encourage and to pull in and help other people. I'd encourage you to think about it and not to give up if the first time someone retreats to Tarsus. If Barnabas could rehabilitate Saul, maybe we can help somebody else on their journey. And like Saul ultimately did with Barnabas, maybe the help can go the other way. Another thing about Antioch was it was profoundly charitable. Profoundly charitable. You know, it, it seems like they had an interesting relationship with people from Jerusalem. Right? I think that's fair. First, Barnabas is sent up to check things out. Then you get the interference in Acts 15. Then you get the interference in Galatians chapter 2. If that had kept happening to me, oh, I might have been looking a little bit sideways when a prophet got up and said, you know what, there's going to be a famine down in Judea. All right? Quick multiple choice, what did the congregation in Antioch do? Serves them right. That's A, probably don't vote for that. Uh, B, they said they don't want us, so it's not really our problem. Uh, C, well, at least that'll keep them busy for a while, so they'll stop interfering. Or D, where are the collection bags? Bang. Oh, it's pretty obvious what they did. Right? What a remarkable example. You know, it's... it's, um, it's pretty easy for us, you know, just a little bit of minor distrust can create a lot of tribalism. You know, I don't know if you're like that, I am. It's very easy to take a dim view and sort of, well, if someone else has got trouble, unless there's a close relationship, it can be hard. But the, the group in Antioch, they, saw straight, they went straight past that. When there was trouble with their brothers and sisters, forget some of the interaction that they'd had, they saw it's all God's vineyard and they were going to render assistance that they could. And that generosity of spirit, which you know, is clearly part of this place, is something that needs to be continued and guarded regardless. The composition of Antioch, it was incredibly diverse. Just flick to Acts chapter 13, verse 1, because this tells us who was there in Antioch and who was, who was involved in, in leadership-type roles, it seems, within that congregation. Now, there were these prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch, Barnabas, uh, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius, the Cyrenian, Manium, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch from childhood, and Saul, Barnabas. So he's the, he's the guy that the uh, slightly conservative, law-abiding congregation in Jerusalem sent up to see what was happening. Um, Simeon is probably from Africa, that's a suspicion, um, the Cyrenian, uh, Lucius, well, that's an island off North Africa, west of Egypt. Uh, Menaean, I don't quite know how to say his name. Well, here's a childhood friend of Herod, right? That puts him in a fairly wealthy, privileged group of people, okay? Antioch was the kind of place that the rich and famous used to congregate. So, unsurprisingly, there was quite a connection, um, Herod and his family uh, and, and Antioch. So, you've, you've got a bloke who's really from the inside of the wealth and power, set. He's part of the, the leadership group. And then you have Saul, right, the ex-persecutor. He was a Jew, but he was actually a Roman citizen from Tarsus. So, you know, he's quite different from Barnabas, again. Imagine the radical cultural differences, right? The extremity you've got um, going on there of, you know, extreme wealth and influence. You've got Semitics, you've got Africans, you've got Gentiles, you've got Jews, you've got Hellenists, right? But they're all included, serving together. It's very easy for us to prefer the, the company and to prefer the service of, of people who look like us or fit our ideal. That's not how Antioch worked. God's making every individual into his image. And we need to spend fractionally less time trying to make people in our preferred image. That's the image that matters, is the image of Christ. So whether it's young people or different cultures, single pam uh, parent families, different attractions, different life experience, whatever. It takes a lot of courage to reach out to people. Antioch demonstrated that. It also takes a lot of courage to involve people, to give them a voice and a role in the congregation despite differences. How do we do that here at Halifax? Well, I've got to be honest, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I don't have every answer. You know, the Sisters Consultation Group, that's a pretty good start. Um, but, you know, let's aspire to be in Antioch. Uh, let's aspire to follow the, the courage that they had um, and seek to embrace difference rather than sameness. Um, take an example, because I feel like I've been a bit down on the Jerusalem congregation. Um, take an example that they did in Acts chapter 6. 
there were complaints that the, uh, the Hellenist widows were being neglected. We don't know if it's true or false. That's never even commented on. But what happens immediately is that the apostles put a group of Hellenist Jews in charge. Right? So they make a structural change immediately to try and include and, and overcome that perceived inequality. And we need to be super sensitive to that and, and also have the courage perhaps to make changes from time to time. Antioch was di very diverse. In many ways, so are we. But it's a bit of a never-ending journey as to how we address that. And a final thing about Antioch, which um, I can't necessarily pull you a scriptural reference for. Um, but history notes that from the 3rd century through to the 8th century, Antioch was an important centre for the development of Christian theology. And the approach to scripture and to the nature of Christ taken in Antioch tended to be historical and rational in contrast to the over-spiritualised allegorical approach taken in Alexandrina, in Egypt. Alexandria, sorry. It's a testament to the quality of the congregation in Antioch that that legacy endured for such a long time. And there's a lot to like about that summation. It suggests the success of Antioch wasn't built on a, a loose approach to God's will, but on a rational, respectful approach to what God said and, and challenging the simple facts we all know with the actual application uh, of, of the values of the gospel, moving past the political preference. A historical, rational approach to God's word is a very high ideal. And if we're going to be uh, an enduring, healthy, Christ-focused community, um, we need to take a, a very... Um, we need to place a, a high, high value on familiarity with the Bible. And exploring the application of it today, whatever history uh, may suggest to us, because that's a long-term investment in the spiritual health of our congregation, however long it is that we need to endure till Christ comes. So just a, a few sort of thoughts in conclusion just to wrap things up. Even in a congregation that appears to be perfect, there's always going to be issues that emerge and opportunities to improve. It might be circumstances changing, it might be the membership altering, it might be society bringing forward new challenges. Who knows what it's going to be? And Acts, while it shows definitely the spread of the gospel, it also shows that some of the growth that the individuals and the congregations had to go through to, to relearn the application of, of Jesus' values. And I guess to be more the movement and less the club and let go of some of those uh, historical preferences. So I guess I'm sort of saying, hey, you know, let's, let's grab the opportunity and try and be more the Antioch. Be brave about implementing the values of Jesus. Be a place of healing, you know, of including and restoring people. Be charitable, even when things might be tense. Welcoming diversity and, and building an enduring respect for God's word. Individually, how can we be a Barnabas? How can we bring people in? How can we be prepared to change our perspective? How can we reach out and encourage other people repeatedly? Because that's probably going to be needed. You know, our Lord was intimately involved in the growth of you know, his believers in the first century. And there's no reason to think he's any less concerned or any less active and involved in our growth individually and collectively. And now we've got a little bit of time to actually come face to face with our Lord and to think about how we're showing that we are his disciples. How is the love that we have for each other, that radical love, being a witness for him? We know he's going to come. Our objective is to become part of his movement, to show his values in all the earth until that day arrives.